You mentioned Jerry Jarrett would film the live shows, but they were not intended for TV. I always wondered how these tapes were done. We saw it a lot in Memphis, but other territories as well, where a single camera would presumably film an entire show and a live commentator was at the event calling the action. I know that Lance was often sitting ringside for the Mid-South Coliseum shows, which were never broadcast in their entirety, but highlights would be shown on television. Since these shows were never released on VHS or DVD, why pay an announcer to be there and call it live? Was it just to give the highlights a more authentic soundtrack? If so, kudos. Those highlights were always fun to watch and may not have been quite as fun if they weren't done live. However, I have to think it would have been cheaper to just show the highlights with the announcers speaking over them like they did in Florida. Not to get too long in this email, but in watching some older what, clips. Too late. But too in, late. Watch, no. in watching some older clips of Smoky Mountain Wrestling using the same practice, I was reminded of how much I enjoyed listening to Phil Rainey do commentary. Who was he? And how was he to work with in Smoky Mountain Wrestling? Any reason why we didn't see him in other promotions? Oh, second question. First, Phil Rainey was a the program director at Channel 43 in Knoxville, but he had also been uh, uh, the host, along with Les Thatcher, of Southeastern Championship Wrestling for the Fullers in the glory days of the 70s, and when everybody watched wrestling and everybody in town watched wrestling. So the wrestling audience there knew him, and we were trying to hopefully, if we employed the program director on the side on weekends, uh, we were trying to get preferential treatment is basically what we were doing, but that never came to pass either. And actually, by that point, Phil was somewhat disinterested and we we and he couldn't travel far from Knoxville. So we got other people when we found out we weren't going to get any favors and, and was probably doing him a favor by not using him. Um, what was the first question? Because <clears throat> it was so long. Uh, arena tapes and high. No, I'm, 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 I'm kidding. Um, no, you're you didn't you don't understand how the the Memphis territory worked. First off, or you would have a better insight into it, Lance was going to be there in Memphis at the Mid-South Coliseum regardless. Uh, he, that, he ring announced every Monday night. He was the ring announcer for years and years. And he was the face of wrestling in Memphis. So he, except, you know, a few, few times a year <clears throat> when he might take a vacation, he was going to be there anyway. But also besides the fact that... um. They would use those highlights uh, on TV. Uh, they didn't start doing that until Jared got more involved with the book and et cetera in the early 70s. Remember uh, uh, Fargo or uh, Lance has mentioned that the way that uh, Lawler came to his and Fargo's attention was Lawler as a teenager sent drawings in of the matches on Monday night and Lance would hold those up while he verbally told the people what had happened the previous Monday. Cause they were too cheap to do a location shoot. <clears throat> and, uh, but then when, uh, when Jarrett started doing big business in the mid South Coliseum, he started having a 16 millimeter film camera go and shoot some of the bigger matches, some of which still exist. Uh, some of which are available at the Tuesday night at the gardens, uh, uh, DVD accompanying the book at Jim Cornette.com that they did the same thing in Louisville, but it, Lance was already there. So and naturally, since he was the voice of TV and he was the ring announcer and he was the face of wrestling in Memphis, he's going to do the commentary and that way they don't have to pay anybody else. Um, and then it, later on, as uh, they got the, their own video equipment, when videotape became a thing right around 78 in Memphis, uh, they started shooting <clears throat> first with one camera and later with two, uh, a hard cam in the stands and a floor camera, all the matches in Memphis, because not only did they show highlights on TV the next week of the angles to perpetuate them, but by then they had a television in Jackson, Tennessee, WBBJ Channel 7, and Tupelo, Mississippi, I believe, Channel 9, and uh, uh, and possibly Jonesboro, uh, where they showed an hour of preliminary matches that they'd shot at the Coliseum at some point, because all those towns got the Memphis TV. So instead of airing the same show twice, they gave them a different show. And that's some of the highly prized tapes in my collection, because Danny Davis, his mother lived in Jackson. He used to roll tape on those shows and he'd trade them to me for other stuff. <laughs> so they, they at the same time. 
Lance was being paid. And by that time he was on salary with Jarrett. So he was getting the same amount of money to do everything he did. And he was making quite a, a good living because Jarrett hired him away from being the program director of a network affiliate in Memphis. So he was making good money in wrestling. Um, but Lance was there as the ring announcer. He was announcing for TV highlights. And he was also at the same time without any, hardly any different voiceover work, just opens and closes doing a secondary television show all with, they're basically paying two cameramen and they get a TV show out of it. So it was fucking genius. For some things like Joe LaDuke throwing Jerry Lawler onto the table or the uh, pile driver through the table by Randy Savage to Ricky Morton. Obviously that second camera was very important, (laughs) but did you have a preference? Did you like the four cam or did you like the wide shot? Um, you know, I, I like the wide shot of the classic Coliseum matches and like the, <clears throat> when it was still 16 millimeter film of the Fargo's or Fargo and Lawler or some of that stuff in my collection that you've seen it. Um, it just looks like classic old fight films, but the floor camera really gave a, a, a new perspective to that show and those arena matches because you can actually see how snug some of the work was and how smooth some of the guys were and how tight some and the facial expressions and but when when they did the Lawler and LeDuc angle they didn't have two cameras they only had one they just put the camera down on the floor of that and see what they would know if they if they were shooting something really important they'd switch it up if they had to but for a while there they just they went with the floor because they didn't have they still only had one camera and they wanted to shoot some things that required more close up activity. That's why we got no long shot of the table throw, which that would have looked fucking awesome. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. <clears throat> but I mean, it's also why some of those Dundee Lawler matches look so impressive because of the close up. You could see those punches. And yeah. I mean, even the working punches, they don't look like they're working punches. They look incredible. And. I've always been a fan of the wide shot too. Like you said, the 16 millimeter stuff. I remember you aired on Smoky Man Wrestling, the Mongolian Stomper versus Dennis Condry from, I guess it would have been 74, 75? 70, 75, 75. 75. And the arena just looks so cool. It just, it looks bright. It almost looks like it's outdoors, even though well, it's indoors. That, the, the reason for that was because in Memphis and, and luckily they didn't have to worry in those days about <clears throat> empty seats, but Memphis didn't really have ring lights per se. Uh, at that at that time, they they kept the arena lights on because the, the Coliseum was domed. That ceiling was domed and it was so high up there that they would keep the, those lights on. It wasn't like at the Little Gardens where you had a, you know, a, a square ring light 20 feet above the ring and everything was focused there. So but with all the, the seats full, my God, it looks so fucking impressive. Yeah. And the people are going crazy. It's not like they're just sitting there and you can hear them behind Lance because he's sitting at the table at ringside doing the commentary. So he's right in the middle of it. <laughs> and when they do the pan shot, I mean, that was the goddamn sad. When I was a kid, I still get goosebumps. The pan shot from all the way back of every seat in the 11,500 seat mid South Coliseum filled with Lance Russell saying 11,500 in the mid South Coliseum Lawler Fargo. That's the fucking coolest thing in the world. Yeah. What was it like for you, you know, after all these years of seeing those highlights and seeing those clips, the first time you actually go into the Mid-South Coliseum? Oh, uh, April 24th, 1977. Just, I, I, now, I, <laughs> <laughs> please don't hold a gun to my head and ask me my wife's birthday. Uh, but, uh, but no, it was so cool because it, it, it the, the, the films at the time they were showing on TV did obviously did not do the color and the, I mean, they were color films, but you know, just in person, the color and the clarity and the pageantry of this fucking big arena. Because at the time, the Louisville Gardens was pretty much the way, you know, well, the Expo Center in Indianapolis probably seated a little bit more. And, and but Cincinnati Gardens I'd seen, but it was fucking, you know, almost empty. But this is a major arena. I've grown up, watched on TV, get to see the matches there. There's Harley Race and Rocky Johnson and Jerry Lawler and Jack Briscoe. And oh, Dusty Rhodes is on the undercard. It was just, it was fucking great. 